Well, welcome to Dairy Livestream. I'm your host, Corey Geiger, Managing Editor of Hordes Dairymen. We are broadcasting from the Cheese Cave, our studio in downtown Fort Atkinson, at the historic W.D. Horde & Sons Company building commissioned by Wisconsin Governor W.D. Horde. This dairy live stream episode is made possible thanks to the general, generous support from our friends at Cargill. We will hear more from Cargill's consultant, Max, later in the webcast. Our conversation today will focus on, we're opening global doors for U.S. dairy ingredients. This webcast will be available on our Hordes Dairyman YouTube channel 24 hours after the live event. Dairy live stream is also available anywhere you like to listen to podcasts, including Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Google Podcasts. Search for Dairy live stream from the convenience of your smartphone to download it. As we get going, a reminder to our audience, as you hear from our panelists, please submit your questions in the GoToWebinar control panel. The earlier you ask a question, the more likely we'll get it answered on the air. Let's turn our attention to, we're opening global doors for U.S. dairy ingredients. Before we hear from Vicki Nicholson-West, let's go to our first poll question. Ingredients accounted for what percent of dairy solids exported in from the US in August of 2021. So these are the solids found in milk, butter, fat, protein, lactose, all those. So your options are 24%, 44%, 64%, or 84%. So go ahead and answer that. We'll give everybody a few seconds longer here to answer. And I think that this will set up a great conversation here today as we talk about U.S. dairy ingredients. So we're well over the midway point for our audience. And the correct answer is 84%. So 27% of you got that correct. And that's according to research by William Lokes, who is Director of Global Trade Analysis for the U.S. Dairy Export Council. That 84% metric of volume would include ingredients such as non-fat dry milk, skim milk powder, whole milk powder, whey products, milk proteins, and even lactose. On a value basis, this category accounted for 57% of August sales. To open the discussion, we invite Vicki Nicholson-West to Dairy Livestream. Vicki is a seasoned veteran who's been with the U.S. Dairy Export Council for 12 years, where she specializes in dairy ingredients in her role as Senior Vice President of Global Ingredients Marketing. In June 2019, Vicki also became the executive director for the U.S. Dairy Export Council's newly formed Singapore operation called the U.S. Center for Dairy Excellence. Prior to joining the U.S. Dairy Export Council, Vicki spent nearly a dozen years with Kraft Food Ingredients as director of marketing, and before that role, Vicki was business director for the same organization. Vicki, can you share with us the importance of dairy ingredients to U.S. dairy exports and why U.S. DEC made a commitment to customers in Southeast Asia with the opening of the U.S. Center for Dairy Excellence in Singapore? Vicki? Hi, Corey. Thanks. Yeah, I'd love to. I, you know, people might not think it's a little sexy, but I do get excited talking about dairy ingredients. So um, maybe that's a bit of the nerd in me. But I mean, for us, exports is very important especially because it actually moves one day's worth of milk each week offshore. And if we weren't able to do that, that would really be a challenge for our farmers and our industry. And the fact that we're able to export to almost 146 countries, I think just really says a lot about the demand for uh, dairy ingredients and in all of our dairy products. You know, for us, we're focused on growing demand. Um, if U.S. dairy and markets that are looking for nutrition, sustainable food solutions to meet not only the customer needs, those food formulators, but also to eventually meet those consumer needs who are looking for things to really enhance their diet. So we're all about solutions. That's what our focus is on dairy ingredients, because we know that we go inside the finished product. We're like the Intel inside, you know. We go into bakery, we go into infant formula, we go into things you might not even think of that are using dairy ingredients, seasonings, beverages, whatnot. But, you know, when you think about how do we provide or deliver those solutions to those food formulators and those food and beverage manufacturers, you know, 
first and foremost, we couldn't do it without the support of, of the farmers. You know, John, you and your peers, uh, the checkoff, the members of the state and region organizations. I mean, you, you're the backbone that really has been able to help us do these things. And the initiative that you referenced, Corey, the next 5% growing from 15 to 20% solids exported. I mean, that's been critical in establishing partnerships and bringing on people capabilities in the markets that we hadn't had before in our, with our office representatives. But for ingredients, we strategically focus on health and nutrition, you know, those dairy proteins and the value of it, the whey proteins, the milk proteins, and how they contribute to muscle health. I mean, it's critical for, you know, throughout the life stages, whether you're an infant, as a young adult, up until, as I like to say, more of your mature years. I don't want to consider me a senior. We're all just more maturing as adults, but helping with that muscle health. And then really focus on innovation and application to drive penetration and volume growth and identifying those new ways, but also providing that technical support and those technical services and insights because we are used in a finished product. So we collaborate across the Federation. We work closely with DMI and the uh, product development group, uh, like the National Dairy Council and the Dairy Research Centers. Those are all critical resources that USDEC uses to really help build the story around why US dairy ingredients. But it all is wrapped in this blanket of a US dairy message, you know, what our farmers bring and the value that they bring to the milk that they produce every day, the nutritional value, the sustainable value of it, all of that we share with those food and food and beverage formulators. Now you mentioned the Center for Dairy Excellence. You know, geographically we focus in some key areas. As I said, we export to over 145, 146 countries, but we focus on really a, a key set because of the growth and the opportunities that they present for our farmers and our dairy processors. So, you know, everyone I hopefully is familiar that Mexico is our first billion dollar market, our friends south of the border. In 2011, we hit that billion dollar mark with them. But it's been a long standing relationship that began in 1998 when we only exported about $158 million worth. And today we have about 80% market share of ingredients. Southeast Asia, China are also key markets for us, and they, they're key markets because of the growth potential they provide. Um, both are about 64, 62% growth respectively. But we also work in other and focus against other key markets like Japan, Korea, Brazil, Colombia, on more targeted focus because of the potential we see and filling that pipeline for future growth. But getting back to Southeast Asia, we're really excited about the opportunities there and what has happened over the 23 years that we've been exporting and had a really pre a, a significant presence in the market. And that's because the growth going on in Southeast Asia is unbelievable. You know, 23 years ago, we opened an office there um, and we were exporting somewhere around uh, $63 million a year, um, really focused on market entry and market development. Fast forward to 2015 and we shifted our focus from a marketing strategy and as an organization on really building innovation and nutrition focus and that value of dairy and as, as John will remember, we kind of kicked off that transition with a U.S. Dairy Business Conference in Singapore, and we brought a number of our farmers with us, and it was a tremendous experience, and it really set the stage. And it set the stage because in 2020, we, we hit the billion-dollar mark in Southeast Asia, $1.3 in sales. Not only did we do that, but we kind of surpassed Mexico a little bit, so we got neck and neck going on. We got a little competition and race, but it's it's a growth market for us, and it's a growth opportunity because of what we see happening in the region. Um, to put it in perspective, 
you know, we have 80% market share in Mexico. We only have roughly 40% market share in Southeast Asia. There's still opportunity for growth. And the growth there versus since 2016 has been well over 60%. And the support and in investment in that region as we develop it has been part of that driving factor, we believe. But we couldn't do it without the support that we get from everyone here online and um, out in the field today who might not be able to listen to us until later on. And that's because we've been able to parlay that into enhancing um, the capabilities we have in Southeast Asia. Uh, we uh, started out with adding people, bringing in uh, an application development director to really help us in how we use those ingredients. We also brought in someone that does consumer and customer research to deep dive in what's going on in the market and understand the consumer dynamics relative to dairy. And we even have a dedicated person on regulatory affairs because it's a region of 13 countries and we really focus on the big six of Vietnam, Singapore, Malaysia, Indonesia, Thailand, and the Philippines. But that really has been the driver to say, you know what? Let's put a stake in the ground and do something that we've never done before. And that's where the U.S. Dairy, the U.S. Center for Dairy Excellence comes into play. That's our first ever brick and mortar uh, establishment offshore. And to put it into perspective, I mean, the Center for Dairy Excellence is a first of its kind ideation hub a uh, destination for learning and also a place to be able to collaborate. It's a collaboration space to engage with food and bever beverage formulation formulators, customers, health professionals, thought leaders, and those even in the regulatory and policy space. But even more so, it's a home away from a home for dairy processors, um, and those from the dairy community that are visiting in the region. And we, we picked the space not only because of the growth that's going on in Southeast Asia, but because of the commitment. There's actually been a concerted effort in the region to commitment into food innovation and expanding in health and nutrition. And that's just a great fit for U.S. dairy and what our farmers are really advocating and supporting, you know, feeding the world and providing nutrition to all. So we're very excited. I could talk about it forever because the space that we have there really, I believe, is state of the art. We have a demonstration kitchen to do culinary, but also um, some benchtop application development. We have a sensory, a small sensory lab to really get a greater understanding of what the local consumer is looking for and how we can collaborate to build or develop those applications that really meet their taste profiles and meeting space in order to be able to educate and ideate and collaborate. Um, and it's a home base for our partner there, our office representative partner to get work done. And it's that hub for the whole region for what we do across those multiple markets. So we're really excited to get in there. I know everybody's excited to get back to the office. We are more so because we really love the space and we really want to have people come and visit and we want to really show off what U.S. Dairy is all about. But uh, we are working virtually and so hopefully you've had a chance to see us online or on our website. Uh, it's Type in USC, USCDE, I believe it's sg.org. If not, I know my team will correct me real quick. But the other thing is uh, feel free to reach out to staff. We're always happy to talk with you, share with you, and we look forward to taking you out to your newest home in Asia Pacific uh, and having you engage with the industry there. But I know I could go on forever. I want to give my cohorts here on the panel some time but I, I really appreciate the time to talk about uh, what we have going on out in Southeast Asia and the growth potential we see to really drive uh, more dairy exports and ingredients. 
Vicki, I want to do a real quick follow-up question here before we turn to John. And I, I think when people in our audience think about the U.S. Dairy Export Council, we certainly have, everybody has a bit of a different lens, but when U.S. Dairy Export Council was founded in 1995, the founder of it was Dairy Management Inc., which is the dairy checkoff organization that all the dairy farmers in the United States contribute. But the membership goes beyond that. Uh, there's processors, there's uh, ingredient traders, there's people in the greater allied industry. And by my count here, I think there's a 110 different member organizations now. So when you talk about uh, the operation and the that you have in, in Singapore, all those people can use that to help uh, grow the U.S. dairy product brand, correct? Yes, well, it, it really is that home away from home for the U.S. dairy community to be able to raise the awareness and the understanding about ingredients, cheeses, and other products. So whether you're a processor, um, you're a farmer member, or uh, a trader, our doors are open and it's all about what we can do to collaborate and work together to really kind of elevate that story and also just dr and drive more utilization of uh, U.S. dairy ingredients. So we're, we're really happy. We've got a number of members actually that have people based in Southeast Asia and Singapore. You know, they've put boots on the ground and made that investment there. And though people can't travel internationally as much as they want to now, for those that are there, We've been able to have them into the facility and sit down, give them a tour, talk about it, um, and plan for the future. And they're very excited, and they've got a lot of ideas on how they can utilize it, engage with their customers. So we're, we're really excited when we're able to have our uh, family here in the States travel over, uh, whether you're an SNR or a farmer or a trader or whomever, and uh, do the same. Thanks, Vicki. As a reminder to our audience, as you hear from our panelists, please submit your questions into the GoToWebinar control panel. And again, the earlier you ask a question, the more likely it will get asked on air. Before we go to John Brubacher, let's go to another poll question. What percent of U.S. milk production was exported as dairy products in 2021? One to two percent, seven to eight percent, 11 to 12 percent and 17 to 18 percent and we'll give everybody about 15 seconds to go ahead and do that so we're reaching the 50 percent mark here so let's go ahead and uh, see what our audience had to say about that and i can tell you that 61 percent of you got that answer right 17 to 18 percent now eight years ago that number would have been closer to our second uh, most popular choice there but again five to six days a month, all of our dairy cows are producing milk for customers outside uh, America. So it's my pleasure to invite John Brubaker to Dairy Livestream. John is the owner of Not Run Dairy in Buell, Idaho, and is treasurer of the United Dairy Industry Association. The United Dairy Industry Association is a federation of state and regional dairy fu producer funded checkoff organizations that provide promotion and marketing programs. So if you're ever in dairy promotion circles and hear SNR, it's state and regionals. That's what the that is. United Dairy Industry Association, or another acronym, UDIA, is overseen by a board comprised of dairy farmers elected by respective boards of their member organizations. John's gonna be able to provide some unique perspective to the US dairy export story as a UDIA is an organization via the state and regional checkoff groups that provided additional funding to the U.S. Dairy Export Council to help grow U.S. dairy exports to the next 5%. If you hear that acronym, that's growing it from 15 to 20%. And we're on our way already, 15 to 20% of U.S. milk production. John, not only do you have perspective as a UDIA board member, you also have traveled to um, U.S. dairy export trade missions. As a dairy farmer, John, what's your perspective as it relates to dairy exports, and what would you like to share with other dairy farmers? Yes, well, thank you, Corey, and, and what an excellent presentation, Becky, that you laid out there. I, I, uh, I thought that was good reinforcement. I know all that stuff, but just to hear it again just makes me all excited. And I'd just like to say, first of all, too, I'm really excited as a dairyman to be involved in exports. It's near and dear to my heart. And, uh, and I've been 
been very privileged to travel on an export uh, mission to Singapore and to see firsthand. And I wish more of our dairymen could get that opportunity because it really opens up your eyes with the, the other part of the world that needs nutrition and then has to buy it all in. We take so much for granted here because in America, we just, you know, we have everything. Uh, what struck me the most of everything is the relationships that we can build with our uh, consumer in Southeast Asia. Uh, like Vicki shared, I was part of that trade mission, and I think there was four of us dairymen that presented, and they had pictures of our farm and how we interact, how you know how we dairy and everything else. And after that presentation, I I mentioned before already that. Uh, it's probably the only time in my life that we will be that popular and almost feel like a rock star because we were just sworn with the traders and the buyers and, and the importers there wanting to know if they could just buy, you know, if they could get product from our dairy because they had no idea the way we dairy in, in America. And it was just so, so good to be able to present to them uh, how we take care of our cows, how we're sustainable and, and uh and, and what kind of product that, that we uh, that we make. So relationships to me is very important. And I think one thing that's really exciting about the CDE over there, uh, we're gonna have, if I understand it right, it, there's, there's, there, uh, they are highlighting different dairy farms showing uh, uh, different dairies in America. So if you tell your story, what I'm saying is that's part of building the relationships. And the other thing I've seen there, there is so much potential growth. Uh, Vicki alluded to it a little bit, but a lot of, lot of our uh, ingredients are formulated, like your skim milk powders are formulated for different age groups. And so, you know, that's, that's very important to them. I know in Vietnam when we were there, uh, you, you could see a, form, a formula developed for like uh, infant, maybe three to five and, and whole way up through and, and the top one would be like 55 plus. So that's for the old, but it's all formula through proteins and everything. And so there's tremendous growth there. And as those economies develop, uh, I just see so much potential to continue to increase our volume going into Southeast Asia. So, so I think there's no better time to be in, involved in exports and right now and the other thing i wanted to share i am really excited about the last poll question you put up corey that 60 some percent got that right so it tells me dairymen are, are tending to follow along a little bit more i think what exports are doing so i, I think that's a good sign and while all of our cows are collectively working on exports five to six days a week there's other there's parts of the country that are supplying more of those exports and some right. of other parts of the country that are supplying more of the domestic market. You you dairy in uh, Idaho, and I know the Pacific Northwest is a, a major ingredient region. Just talk a little bit about that. And okay. We just, uh, we just saw each other here in August at the Idaho Milk Processors Association. Mm -hmm. a great mix of dairy farmers and processors there, but tell us a little bit more, John. Sure, I'd be glad to. Uh... Our region, uh, Dairy West, consists of the state of Idaho and Utah. And, you know, in the Intermountain West here, we have uh, a great volume of, of dairy products consumed, but not a great base of consumers because we don't have the population base. So in the high 70s, or oftentimes in the 80% of our milk volume is exported through ingredients, uh, cheese or butter. So we're very much an export state because it has to leave our boundaries. And we are very fortunate, especially in Idaho, we have some of the most modern dairy plants for infant formula, different uh, high weight proteins. Um, and a lot of that gets all exported. So we see firsthand how important exports are to our uh, states and regions here in the West. And before we turn to Mark Stevenson, let's go to our next poll question. What percent of new U.S. milk production this year is headed to export? Select one answer, 25%, 50%, 75%, or 100%. So we'll go ahead and give everybody a little bit of time there, and we'll talk about that before we uh, 
and, and Mark may expound on it as well. So uh, go, go ahead and cast your vote there. And again, and again this uh, webcast will be on YouTube and uh, many podcast channels uh, Thursday morning here when we return. So let's go ahead and cut that poll question off. The correct answer is 75%. We're talking here the last 12 to 18 months. And a little bit more detail on that, that's because the U.S. is past peak child. And that's peak, peak child, what's that mean? Birth rates are falling. And 95% of the world's population is beyond our borders. And while the U.S. consumers continue to eat more dairy each year, the major growth lies with growing middle class beyond our borders. Mark, you've studied dairy exports for many years. Please share your insight as to this journey that we've been on as a U.S. dairy community and how we're reaching customers and what this all means on the dairy export front. Welcome. Well, thank you, Corey, and happy to be here again today. Um, you know, I, I thought maybe we'd back up just a second and, and talk a little bit about remembering what the difference is between the ingredients that we're talking about today and normally what we would be discussing as final consumer dairy products. Um, you know, it, this goes a long way back in time. You know, milk used to separate naturally in a bucket overnight into a, a cream layer and a skim layer on the bottom. But it really wasn't until we had Babcock that realized that we could do this through centrifugal force and create a cream stream and uh, a stream of skim milk. At that point in time, we had the opportunity to think about ingredients. Well, obviously cheese and butter and yogurt are final consumer product, but other products like whey proteins are not final consumer products. They're usually going to be put into some other product for consumption. And some products like skim milk powder could either be considered, um, you know, final product in some sense, but most of the time it's going to be uh, an ingredient. Same thing is true for lactose or or other things. But our knowledge of these dairy ingredients might be a bit truncated. So I thought I'd just try to open things up a little bit and think about what milk really is. Uh, we've only begun to scratch the surface of this. Milk's a really rich organic soup of potential ingredients that we're now able to harvest commercially, just like we were able to separate the fat portion from the skim portion. We now have other processes whereby we can separate a lot more ingredients out of uh, a milk stream. And cheese making naturally separates casein proteins into the cheese matrix uh, from the whey proteins that are largely left behind in the vat. But we can separate the casein and whey protein molecules with microfiltration membranes before cheese making ever happens. And that provides us with useful clean ingredient streams which are uncontaminated by the cheese making process, which is to say there's no salt or enzymes or color additives in the byproducts. We don't have to bleach a waste stream if we do that. Another step utilizing ultrafiltration um, after that microfiltration stream can, and using ion exchange can do things like separate lactoferrin, another ingredient from dairy that's uh, really got <clears throat> uh, potential uses and, and already being used in some places now. We can pull out other products like glycomacropeptides. These are things that most of us haven't even heard of before. But it's not just about the skim fraction. Even the cream in the butterfat portion of milk has components which are desirable either together or in separate streams. And uh, Vicki was talking a little bit about food formulators. And they think about these things quite differently than we do. They, they usually begin to think about the properties of the ingredients. How does it gel? How does it foam? What's the shear strength of the foam or gel? What's the stability under heat or pH? As well as flavor. So dairy is a natural ingredient source, I think, has a potent future. But, you know, here's where we need to understand what our customer needs are. Is it nutrition? Yeah, most of the time we're thinking that it's nutrition, but it isn't always. It could be the properties that the ingredient brings for functional uh, use in, in making other food products. Is it cost competitive? And that's the way that we have to begin to market these ingredient uh, streams. Uh, just for instance, in some parts of the world, particularly over there in Southeast Asia, 
Um, gut health is much discussed. We don't talk about it too much yet in the U.S., but um, many countries do, and dairy can play a prominent role in something like that. And other cultures may be more interested in the basic nutrition bump that you get from animal proteins in the diet. And others may want the flavor profiles that are added to something like uh, uh, snacks, you know, that we're, we're doing. So dairy has an awful lot of potential that is not yet scratched. And I think it's something that we're going to look forward to uh, for additional sales. So uh, it's important to think about this. Not only is a big volume of our product being exported as ingredients, we are cost competitive with other exporting countries for a lot of these ingredient prices. And quite honestly, um, an economist would tell you it's that last load of milk that sets the price for the marketplace. And we often think about um, that milk in Idaho or California or other places that is being exported, has to be competitive with the rest of the world. And uh, that's what's setting the tone for much of our prices. I just sent some uh, information to you, Corey, this morning about how the New Zealand um, expectation of milk prices compares to U.S. And, you know, if you're looking at our prices being more like that, uh, perhaps uh, this year, that wouldn't be a bad thing. It, it looks uh, looks fairly strong for us right now. Well, thank you, Mark. We're going to turn to questions in a moment here and go ahead uh, to our audience members. Go ahead and submit that in our GoToWebinar question panel. And Today's Dairy Livestream is sponsored by Cargill Max. We'd like you to meet Max, your Cargill Consultants upgraded sidekick. When you've got a tough nutrition decision, we can just ask Max. We've updated our powerful nutrition software solutions so we can help you feed for maximum profitability, create more predictable performance, and react with real-time feedback to make tough calls easier. Learn more at cargill.com forward slash meet max. Again, that's cargill.com forward slash meet max. Now let's turn to a short video. Well, again, thank you for Cargill for sponsoring today's dairy live stream. We're going to move into the question and answer part. And Vicki, we're going to talk a little bit about, I, I was reading this here recently, uh, Permeate is a growing product category and China has just begun to export it for human consumption. Can you tell us a little bit more? And uh, Mark was talking about all the different components of milk, but in, in Permeate's one of them. What is its value uh, to human nutrition? Well, let, let me step back and for those who might not be familiar with Permeate, when you make whey protein concentrate, you've got a co-stream. And that co-stream is going to be not only high in lactose, but it's also high in, you know, milk minerals, ash, as we call it. And we call that co-stream permeate. And when you dry it, we found it's got some pretty unique properties. Now, I know many have used permeate for the last number of decades um, for feed purposes. It's always been known that the lactose, the carbohydrate process, content is good for piglets in their development. And of course, China being really heavy on pork and loving that, they've used it for quite some time. But also research done out of the, the dairy research centers, and one of them being University of Wisconsin, Madison, that did a lot of this base work years ago, found that permeate is really great for um, not only being a flavor potentiator, enhancing the flavor, whatever matrix you put it in, but you can also reduce the amount of sodium yet. And in China and a number of Asian countries, sodium reduction is really important, it's just as much as it's been here in the States. So one of the things was transitioning and allowing and, and saying, hey, permeate would be a great use in food applications because of the properties that it has and the fact that it really helps in adding to the flavor and also elevating the value of permeate itself from a feed value to a food value. And China's demand for permeate and also their desire to have low sodium was a perfect, perfect location. 
It's just that it took some work over the last 10 years because permeate was not allowed for food use in their standards. And in early 2020, uh, that approval was reached even um, after it being, you know, having a codex standard. And that really opens the door for opportunities for us because as we, as a demand for whey proteins, dairy proteins goes up, that means you're making more of a co-stream. And now we have a place that's going to create a demand for that co-stream and provide that balance, but also elevate the value of that ingredient, which ultimately elevates the value of the milk overall. And so we're really excited because we've shown through research, it does great in soups, really good in bakery applications. Um, and we've got research underway in, in China to look at what are other local friendly applications that it would benefit and that um, how we can work with different food and beverage manufacturers to incorporate it into their products. So, uh, you know, we already export, what is it, I think about 253,000 metric tons today, a year. Man, think about moving that and doubling it into the food, food realm. I think that's a sweet little uh, recipe right there we got going on. And so uh, we're going to keep working at it and uh, not only elevating the protein side, but also the co-stream side. I, I think everybody can speak to this question that just came in from a reader here. And it can start all the way at the farm, John, through the domestic channels and then over to our customers across uh, our shores. <laughs> But transportation costs and just getting product places is uh, is an issue. Talk through that, and are are we as a collective U.S. dairy community just going to absorb those costs of transportation, or can we pass some of that along? What are we seeing here? And maybe we'll start with uh, we'll start with our customers abroad, Vicky, and we'll bring this home. We'll go, Vicky, Mark, and then John. Oh wow! I know that this is this is a big topic and it's uh it's an important one but it's a challenging one and uh i know that on the export side our u.s dairy processors and traders are working tirelessly with their customers um either splitting the costs or being creative a lot of innovation going on to try and manage the challenges of the supply chain both from a timing standpoint and the cost standpoint and at the same time Within U.S. DAC, there's efforts going on within our trade policy team, working with the U.S. government and also with uh, peer organizations on finding solutions to try and help mitigate this. So there's a lot of work going on across the board to try and help ease that that stress. Um, but I do know in talking with uh, like our, our insights team, uh, we still have a road ahead of us. So more to come on that. Mark? Yeah, <clears throat> transportation is, you know, just the friction in the system. Um, sometimes transportation is almost a neglectable portion of the cost, and today it's very much in the headlines. But, you know, a lot of the transportation, not all of it, but a lot of the transportation we're discussing is the uh, trans um, oceanic transportation, you know, shipping. And the big part of the cost in that is not in actually sending this product uh, across an ocean. It's not the distances between here. It is the cost of getting containers loaded and getting those containers on ships through ports and off of ships. Um, so we're not at a competitive disadvantage with a lot of our other countries that might be sending ingredients to uh, a certain region of the world, unless it's just that our ports are more plugged or clogged than theirs are. Um, but costs for transportation have certainly gone up. Those costs will be shared, as Vicky said, across the system. Um, you know, the people who are shipping are going to have to absorb some of the cost. The customers who are receiving are going to have to absorb some of those costs ultimately. That's the way it, it settles out. And John, you've been at a number of industry meetings here as of late and certainly have a dairy farmer perspective. What what are you hearing on transportation? Well, I'm I'm hearing more, it's almost more of a problem to get it 
to the ports from from the processor. But once it's there, it's a time issue of actually getting it on a ship and getting it to where it needs to be. As far as cost, about two thirds of the cost is getting it to so say from Idaho to the coast. There's about two thirds of that cost compared to a third of the cost to go across the ocean because they, a container going going across over to uh, Asia is a lot cheaper than what a container is coming this way. If you know what I mean, that's what I'm told anyway. Um, Vicky probably knows better than me, but uh, it's 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 minuscule going across in a container versus coming this way. But the timing issue right now is getting our products there in time and not 60 days late. That's that's the big issue. Cost-wise, I think it's like Mark said, it can be worked out, it can be shared or whatever. But to me, I think timing is a more issue. Uh, one of our, uh, and I you know, happen to know this audience member, and just for a little bit more of a technical definition on permeate, he writes in, permeate is made when milk is filtered through a fine sieve or membrane using a technique called ultrafiltration. Many of us have heard that, but this filtering separates the lactose, vitamins, and minerals collectively called permeate from the milk, protein, and fat. Permeate is a valuable part of fresh milk, and I thanks for that sending that in. Let's turn to ingredients. You know, I remember uh, on a trip to Vietnam how people there, especially young mothers, really valued the infant formula that had the American flag on it. Now, one of the uh, audience members, a longtime listener, says uh, U.S. export in ingredients, U.S. exports ingredients for infant formula, but not much infant formula itself. Why is that? Is could that change in the future, Vicky? I think you're maybe best equipped to give that a whirl, and then maybe Mark wants to chime in too. Well, you know that's an interesting question, and and. Yes, uh, you know, our infant formula manufacturers in the U.S. export infant formula out of the U.S., but they also have manufacturing facilities around the world that address the regional needs, and they also buy U.S. ingredients for those factories. So I do understand that for many of our infant formula manufacturers that are U.S. owned, uh, they're making formulas that are unique to the demand and the needs of those consumers. And it's a really interesting category because, you know, in the U S we're probably familiar with having infant formula. And then you might have uh, something that you have, you could get for your toddlers, maybe from six months on to 18 months in a number of other countries, particularly Asia and even Latin America, there is a whole portfolio and realm of not just a zero to six, but what the purpose of that zero to six is and yeah. then follow on formula and toddler formula. And I'll tell you the first time I went down one of those aisles, you think our cereal aisle is boggling? <laughs> Walk down yeah. an infant formula aisle yeah. in a foreign market and it's all powder because it's lighter and it has a longer shelf life and then they add water to it versus it being ready to drink or, or already made. And it's, it's really mind-boggling, but they focus on so many specific benefits, whether it's brain development or it's your infant formula for colic or what have you. And I, I, I think it's from a marketing and a business standpoint, these infant formula com companies are working to meet that need and doing it at a, at a local level. Uh, we're still benefiting from that. We're working with infant formula manufacturers in Vietnam, those that aren't U.S. companies. We're working with U.S. companies that have manufacturing abroad. So it's really been a win-win for our industry because we're working with them domestically in the U.S. They are exporting some. They are also manufacturing some offshore, and there are customers there. And we're learning from them just as much on those unique needs, those specific customer dynamics, and uh, you know, building that that preference for our ingredients. Mark, any additional insight? No, not not much. But I, Vicky, I'm sure would uh, also say yes. It's it certainly is true. But 
U.S. has a, a very good reputation for safety and high quality standards, you know, for products that are coming over. So that stands very well in our stead long terms to supply the kind of ingredients that people want to buy. And I know it's a frustration to a lot of dairy producers. They just want people to drink more milk. And frankly, I don't care. Um, I really don't. If we want to eat, you know, more dairy products and consume them as ingredients through other things, give it to people the way they want it. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. let's not worry about the form factor that uh, a particular country wants it in. Let's give it to them the way they want it. John, I think we need to paint a picture here a little bit for our audience. We, we talk a lot about Southeast Asia, and I know you've been to parts of it yourself, and, and I want you to sh paint a couple pictures here. Number one, these are hot and humid places. Paint a picture what a, the life of a dairy cow is in these regions. And, and then I'm going to follow up, and if, if you forget this part, you know, Vicki talked about shorter self, shelf lives and uh, why powders are uh, important here. And we, in Vietnam, I know you saw one of the most modern milk processing plants right. and labor is readily available in Vietnam, but they had a robot assisted to reformulate UHT milk. But let's talk about the cow side of this first and why long-term okay. area will be a good customer because what a cow's life is there. All right, sure, Corey. Yeah, um, those of uh, us that have dairied or lived in more humid climates, you can really understand. But now, like Vietnam, there pretty much I'm not exactly how, sure, but I would consider at least trub tropical. Uh, to put it in perspective, it's I call it 90, 90, 90 some degrees and 90 percent humidity. I know when we were there wearing our sport coats and everything, it was it was a challenge because. Uh, we weren't quite used to that and uh and it was i think it wasn't even really necessary in the hottest time of the year but but really yeah the, the cows are not going to survive there i mean uh at least be productive because it's just not a climate that's conducive to, to dairy they do have some up in the mountains i i understand but it, it's very limited and uh it, going forward it's it's a it's a young population that wants this proteins and uh, they're going to be important a lot of it because they just can't make it on their own. And then the second part of your question, yes, we uh, we visited Vena Milk. Uh, you know, going in there, I always kind of looked at Vietnam as a third world country. Uh, it, maybe some aspects it is, but when we went to that plant, it, there probably there might be one or two plants in America now that's as modern as that is. But it was com completely robotic. Uh, I think there was maybe, I don't know, Corey, do you remember maybe three or four people working there in the control center? But basically, most of the people, uh, and this plant provides the school milk for the for basically the whole country. The people that they had there working basically were tearing the cartons apart, apart checking for quality issues and making sure it is completely safe. And that was so amazing that... Uh, like you said, Corey, you know, you got all kinds of labor force there that would, would just be glad to have a job. But this here was so modern, it was mostly robotic. And basically, the people working in there were con computer controllers or uh, for quality control. So absolutely fantastic. Mind-boggling. Vicki, this question comes from an audience member here, and, and I don't know that it pertains to Southeast Asia, but it definitely pertains to the MENA countries, Middle East and North Africa. And the question, I'm going to read the question just as it came in, and we might want to alter it a little bit, but what are the perceptions of milking, mixing protein sources, in this example, dairy and plant-based for the future? And and I know that there is some mixing, not maybe not... Uh, protein sources, but ingredients in some of these countries as a, and so talk a little bit about that, as, that journey. Yeah, we do find, and we've learned um, that there are a number of, you know, manufacturers that blend or that will use more than one protein or protein source in their application or in their, their finished food product. Um, you hear it like in nutrition bars or, or other such, or even in beverages, it could be a blend of, say, whey protein and a plant protein. Um, 
you know, that is one of those things where it's kind of a love-hate relationship. I'd love it to be all dairy protein, and I'm sure a number of people would do. But at the end of the day, I um, we don't want to be left out of the game, and we'd hate to be exclusive. They blend with exclusively plant. So there are some food manufacturers out there that are doing it, and they're focused on a certain customer base that is either one looking to have, you know, a mix of dairy and plant, or two, they're trying to manage costs. And that had been a big part of it in the past, though we are hearing things that, you know, their plant protein costs are also rising too. So that's, that's really what you see. The third, not so sure on the accuracy, but sometimes you hear from a flavor of functionality perspective, why they blend. I think manufacturers use all kinds of different, you know, reasons for their business based upon what best suits it. Our goal is to make sure that dairy is always part of the consideration set. When you refer to MENA, you know, that's one of those markets for us. Um, Middle East, North Africa is kind of Europe's Mexico. They're right there in their backyard and they're really close geographically. And they've spent a lot of time, you know, very much cultivating that, that region and that market. Um, so our market share there is uh, representation is low. It is a growth market, uh, but it's a challenging one to kind of really break the paradigm, but we're not giving up on that. So growth over the past year for our milk powders and our whey proteins has uh, grown. And we're looking in, and constantly looking at how we can continue that growth in that market going forward. Vicki, you talk a little bit, you talk some about versatility of dairy ingredients. How how does your team go about uh, marketing that versatility? I mean, the, the proteins, for example, in milk are the most perfect known to humanity. And so how do you go about and tell that story, especially to cultures that maybe aren't as dairy, have that rich dairy tradition? Well, you know, there are a number of tools and pathways that we use to do that. and. Uh, we have a network of office representatives around the world in nine different markets, regions that assist us in that. And they bring that local insight and ideation to it. But also we work with key experts that help us in developing those technical tools, whether it's National Dairy Council, the Dairy Research Centers, consultants. And then, um, as I noted, like in Southeast Asia, we actually have uh, a expert in application development a food science background and product development that also brings that into light and is familiar with dairy ingredients but we also use a number of different pathways whether it's um, seminars hands-on workshops trade missions videos webinars we're using all different venues to share the information but we're also making sure that the information that we pull, like, pull together, that content, that it's based in science, it's based in the product science, the nutrition science, and that we're partnering with those that can help be our champions to elevate that. So we do have partnerships also in region, in markets, with academics to do the, the technical partnership, with nutrition organizations, we include health professionals, dietitians, et cetera, and also with even, you know, culinary organizations with our, our, my cohorts in cheese, but also who every now and then try to dabble on the wayside and the dairy protein side, which we're happy to see do. So we're, we're as you could say, we're using everything that we can find in our toolbox and trying to expand it every day in order to help educate and um, inform traders, buyers, end users, importers. And as we start to bring this to a, a close here, I think you know, the things that Vicki's talking about here, and I want John and Mark to talk a little bit about this, you know, how, what products are being created in these countries are quite a bit different, you know, if it, than they are in America. And that's why, we have to fit uh, the culture and the food and traditions in, in these countries. And I know in your travels, John, and we'll turn to Mark after you, you know, what's put on top of a pizza looks incredibly different than what it is here. Just 
tell us what you saw. Sure. Well, you know, when we were in, in Singapore there, and this, I want to say this is why this is very important with the CTE Center there uh, on the century, because when you formulate uh, different things, you, you got to make it sure it fits that culture. Now, like I know, Corey, you can remember, too, we had uh, we had a pizza there that was covered in crab meat. Uh, you know, it wasn't that uh, tasty for me, but that's what that, you know, that's what that culture likes. So we have to we have to work along with with what that culture is adapted to in order to get our products in there. So that that was one thing that I, you know, thought was very interesting. But that's why it's so important to have a stake in the ground there with the facilities like we have that we can actually work on things like that get our products in into uh, 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 a food that they really like and and then they will they will uh, respond to it mark <laughs> yeah Corey, i'll put the shoe on the other foot um several years ago when i was first in china um the chef at the um place where we were staying had been told that the previous uh, folks from America did not prefer the Chinese breakfast that was there. So um, the chef should make an American breakfast for me. And they bought, brought out the stuff that was the most b bizarre collection of things, you know, <laughs> that I would have eaten, but this was their perception of what an American would want to eat. And I think that sometimes we do that when we're bringing ingredients to other countries. We need to truly understand yeah. what they want understand yeah. we don't need to make them into us you know we need to provide them with the things that that they would like to eat and be presented with it in the way that they would like to have it presented and, and Corey, if i could vicky you could share too you know you have worked a lot with uh, uh the, some of the universities especially in china with with teaching uh, on the culinary side teaching chefs how to use u.s dairy products so maybe share a little bit about that yeah, we our, our cheese program works with different culinary institutes and chefs on on how to use cheese. We actually also work with universities and their food science departments on understanding dairy ingredients and how yeah. how they can make foods with that. And I, sure. I tell you, even these students, you know, what we tell them and share are the basics, how it works, flavor profile, you know, the the different things that we might do with it and let them loose with it. And they come back with the, some of the most innovative products and ideas on how to use, mm -hmm. you know, whey protein or permeate or how to use even milk powder. I don't know if you've ever had cheese tea and I'm sure you're thinking, what the heck is that? But think of hot tea and then with a layer on top that looks like foam, it's actually a mixture of like cream cheese and skim milk powder. And it's really good. <laughs> little sweet but it's really good and we would never think of that in the states but they think of yeah. you know they're thinking culturally what sounds good what would be really flavorful and what people like and and the same goes for other types of products and foods so different seasoning blends and how they would incorporate dairy ingredients into those and and that's what we want we want to actually inspire and just kind of set the stage and help them ideate and let them brainstorm. And mm -hmm. as they create ideas, you know what? Some of those make it back to the US and drive yeah. consumption back here too. So don't be surprised if you see cheese tea on a menu somewhere soon on the West Coast. <laughs> well, thank you, Vicki. Our next dairy live stream will air on Wednesday, November 17th, 2021 at 11 a.m. Central Time and will be archived on the Hordes Dairyman YouTube and podcast channels the very next day, just like this episode. I do look forward to seeing you then. I'd like to again thank our sponsor, Cargill. And on behalf of Vicki Nicholson-West, John Brubaker, Mark Stevenson, I am Corey Geiger, your host. Thank you for joining us today, and we wish you all a good day. Goodbye, everyone.